In case you're not familiar with us, League of Education Voters is a statewide nonprofit working with families, educators, and leaders to build a brighter future for every Washington student. Our website is educationvoters.org. We believe that education is a tool for justice. One of the systems that perpetuate racial injustice experienced by communities of color is our schools. We believe every child deserves an excellent public education that provides equitable opportunities for success. In order to achieve this, we must pursue radical change in our school systems for equity, justice, and liberation. We must build schools and systems that honor the humanity in every student. Welcome to our free online webinar series, Lunchtime Webinars. We started this series eight years ago to share information and build knowledge on important and timely issues. Today's webinar features Washington State Teachers of the Year on what students need for 2022-23. Although 2021-22 was the first school year in person since the COVID pandemic began, it was anything but normal. In fact, students, families, and educators all say that this past year has been the most challenging year they have ever experienced. In this webinar, Washington State Teachers of the Year, Jared Kep from 2022, Brooke Brown from 2021, Robert Hand, 2019, Mandy Manning from 2018, and the Washington, make that the National Teacher of the Year from 2018, Nate Bowling from 2016, and Lion Terry from 2015, will share what they're hearing from students, parents, and colleagues in their community in the aftermath of the 2021-22 school year, and what students need in preparation for the start of 2022-23, and what intangibles they teach students outside of academic curriculum. Students from across Washington State will offer their feedback. And now I would like to ask our panelists to introduce themselves, starting with our students. Students, feel free to, uh, to jump in as you feel the spirit. Hello, I'm Laurel. I'm a student at Western Washington University, and I'm here with the root of our youth and very excited to hear what happens and speak if called to. I'll pass to whoever wants to go next. Hi, I'm Michelle Mukasa, and I'm a student at Washington State University, and I'm with the rate of our youth as well. Hi there, my name is Waylon. Uh, I am a rising senior at Auburn Mountain View High School, and I am the chair of the Washington State High School Democrats. All right, uh, how about Jared? If you would uh, introduce yourself, that would be great. Hey there, how are you always named Jared Kep. I'm Wuck Chumney and the 2022 Washington State Teacher of the Year. I'm the uh, Native Student Program Specialist for North Thurston Public Schools, and I am joining you from the traditional lands of the Nisqually people. I look forward to our conversations today. All right, let's pass it to Nate. And Nate, feel free to pass to whoever you like. Uh, my name is Nate Bowling. As mentioned, I'm the 2016 Washington State Teacher of the Year. Uh, I currently teach out of the United States at the American Community School of Abu Dhabi, and I'm interested in providing some insights on my experiences over there and what I see happening back here in Washington State. Uh, and then I will pass it to Mandy. Hi, I'm Mandy Manning. I am the 2018 Washington State and National Teacher of the Year. Um, I'm currently the Communications Digital Content Specialist for the Washington Education Association, but I spent 21 years in the classroom, most recently in Spokane, Washington, uh, in the Newcomer Center at Ferris High School, teaching new immigrant and refugee students. Uh, and I will pass to Lyon. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Lyon Terry, the 2015 Washington State Teacher of the Year. Uh, I am currently an assistant principal in the Highline School District at Mount View Dual Language Elementary School. So I also spent 25 years teaching elementary school and preschool. So I kind of bring that perspective. I'll pass it on to Brooke. Good morning, everyone. I'm the 2021 Washington Teacher of the Year. 
and uh, spent the last 15 years teaching English and ethnic studies at Washington High School. And this past year, I transitioned to working at the district office as our um, instructional equity specialist. So really looking at um, curriculum and pedagogy and, and uh, supporting teachers as they support our students. Uh, and I will pass to Robert. All right, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Robert Hand, 2019 Washington State Teacher of the Year. I teach at Mount Vernon High School, uh, Family and Consumer Sciences, and Audio Engineering and Sound Production. I'm glad to hear what everybody else's uh, experiences have been like and learn and, and take some insights into this next year with uh, enthusiasm and excitement. It's always good to be here and chat with you all. Fantastic. Well, thank you all again for being here. Really, really appreciate it. To begin today's webinar, I would like to acknowledge that we are on the ancestral and unceded traditional lands of the 29 federally recognized and non-federally recognized tribes in Washington state, including the Chehalis, Chinook, Colville, Cowlitz, Ho, Jamestown Sklalem, Kalispell, Lower Elwha Clallam, Lummi, Macaw, Muckleshoot, Nisqually, Nooksack, Port Gamble Sklalem, Puyallup, Quileute, Quinault, Samish, Sauk Seattle, Shoalwater Bay, Skokomish, Snoqualmie, Spokane, Squaxin Island, Stiligwamish, Suquamish, Swinomish, Tulalip, Upper Skagit, and Yakima. We give thanks to elders both past and present, our native and indigenous colleagues, and the land itself. A couple of housekeeping items before we begin. You'll notice a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. This is a space for you to submit questions to us. If time permits, we'll have about 10 minutes for questions after the panel discussion wraps up. As always, feel free to send any feedback about the webinar quality to us on the chat function or at info at educationvoters.org. And speaking of the chat function, you're welcome to use it to check in and comment on anything you hear. Welcome Laurel, Michelle, Waylon, Jared, Brooke, Robert, Mandy, Nate, and Lion. We've got three questions that we'll be addressing today. The first one is, what are you hearing from students, parents, and colleagues in your community on how the 2021-22 school year went? The second question is, what do you recommend based on what you hear that students need in preparation for 2022-23? And then finally, what are you teaching students when you're not teaching academic curriculum? In other words, what are you modeling for your students? What social emotional learning work are you doing? Or other superpowers that bring to your work? And Mandy, this can certainly apply to you when you're working with the WEA and the educators. Brooke, this certainly applies to you at the district as well. Nate, this can apply outside of the US for sure. And Lion, in, in your work as an administrator too. So um, we'll get started with that. And, and Waylon, Laurel, and Michelle, what you're hearing from your fellow students will be very, very important uh, as, as part of the first two questions in particular. And, uh, and also, I'd love to hear your feedback on the third question on, on the superpowers that the teachers bring. So uh, feel free to jump in however you see fit. Uh, we'll go ahead and start with that first question on what are you hearing from students, parents, and colleagues in, the, in your community on how this past school year went? And uh, whoever wants to jump in, just go right ahead. I'll go ahead and put myself on mute. I'll go first. <laughs> um, so because I have kind of a bird's eye view of what's happening, at least in Washington State, um, and I get to hear a lot about what's happening in different schools and in different environments, we're hearing a lot of the same things um, that there's a lot of uh, behaviors that are coming up within the school environment, but not necessarily because kids haven't, you know, because of the tumultuousness of going from remote to in-person and, and back and forth and quarantines and all of that stuff. Um, those things are obvious, but really what we're seeing is um, a feeling, a, a bit feeling of hopelessness because there's so much coming at everybody all at the same time and everybody's getting messages that they're not doing enough, that kids are behind, that all of these things are happening, which aren't necessarily true um, because the idea of behind is a construct that we have whoever created. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean we needed to go at the exact pace that we were going before um, COVID happened. Uh, and plus, there's so much uh, inequity that happens across the board in our school system that was 
exponentially exacerbated, existed, um, but was then exacerbated by COVID. And there's still a failure to address that at the systemic level. And so what we see is, is just a, a feeling of futility. Like, why are we in school? Why are we trying to do the exact same thing? Why are we trying to go back to a system and a structure that was ineffective before? And now it's, you know, excessively so. Plus, we've got uh, inflation that is making it hard for families to live and exist. Where I mean, <laughs> uh, things just keep getting compounded. So I don't think it's a surprise that kids are coming in school and they're dissatisfied with the environment. Uh, and so that's been a really big challenge. Um, but I would love to hear from uh, the rest of you who have actually been in the classroom to see how that's really playing out. It's just a, it's a diff very difficult time. Um, I think it's always been difficult, but it's time that we actually do something about it. Yeah, I can, I can hop in a little bit. Um, yeah, I, Mandy, a lot of what you said really kind of echoed with my experiences. Um, there's, um, there's definitely a, a sense of relief that we made it through. Um, and I also feel like we, we were all expected to get back to business as usual and act like nothing happened. Um, and whether or not that, that was the exact case, that was the way that it felt for everybody. Um, and there was this sense that we all just had to show up, um, you know, pull up our, you know, pull up our pants and, and try a little bit harder and everything will go back to normal because we can't lose anymore. And I think that like you said, Mandy, it brings up the point like, well, was what we had before really working anyway? And are we really missing a huge opportunity to focus on building community, relationships, seeing each other, being present with each other, and realizing that ed quality education is a product of everything that goes into it? And that the healing, it has to involve everybody in the community, right? And I feel like um, the, the pressures express themselves to everyone in different ways, but we didn't always have those moments to feel like we were all in it together. I feel like there, there was a lot of tension between teachers and administrators because for whatever reason, we adhere to this hierarchy rather than, you know, showing up for kids together every day. Um, and then, you know, there's a tension between teachers and students and students and students. Um, some of it's real, some of it's kind of perceived, but the outcomes are the same. So it's a lot of stress. But I will say that um, also sort of being like the, the lead for our Native Studies program, we have a lot of we have a lot more freedom doing what we do in our program than I, I think that most teachers have. And so we've been able to adapt and focus on community because it is such a foundational part of decolonizing pedagogy that while students may feel that tension throughout their day, they, our class was typically the one that they came to, the one that they missed. And so you really start to see the real magic that goes into education and focusing on community and building relationship isn't outside of education. It is critical to it. Well, I'll tell an experience about from my experience this year uh, that leads right along with that, Jared, is that, um, you know, there was so much stress in the beginning of the year about like, oh my gosh, these kids have lost so much learning and we have to do it and we have to follow the COVID rules and, 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 and it just created this tension in the school, it seemed like we're around the teachers and the admin and the kids that also led to some behaviors that were challenging. Then in the spring, we, we were like, okay, let's just loosen a little bit. And teachers went on field trips and we had a spring carnival and we had, uh, you know, these, um, community events that actually brought people together. We had over 400 people show up for a reading night. 
right? I mean, like people are desperate for that community and that connection that that we had that was so lost during our COVID COVID times. And I think you know, in the beginning of 2122, there was this sense that we did like we had to like just restrict access. Like we have kindergarten and first grade parents who've never been in our building before and things like that. And then when we allowed people to come back in, allowed people to connect and and to be in community together, it was suddenly this revelation that, oh yeah, this is what we're all about. This is really where we build the relationships and where we build the connection to the school that makes it such a powerful experience rather than just the, you know, the academics that are important, but uh, are lost if we don't have that, those relationships built. I feel like um, if on a, an outlook from inside a classroom as a student, in a public high school coming back into this this new environment that is it felt incredibly unfamiliar even though i had already attended almost a full year there it felt completely different but i think the the main thing i'm hearing from my the fellow students um, from around the area is that there was a, a big lack of consistency um, not only in education but how it's uh, how it was taught what our expectations were what were we expected to achieve um, and one thing students need to be successful is consistency and consistency and expectations and we didn't have that this year because there wasn't anything that was consistent and it still isn't um, so i feel like a lot of my teachers were really stressed out about trying to provide that um, but they didn't give the students a chance to also like work on our own. There wasn't a lot of independence um, in the classroom, which students are resilient. Students will overcome. And when teachers are stressed, students sense it, students get stressed. And it's just like this snowball that builds up and builds up and builds up. So I feel like we were just on that journey all year. But then in addition, um, I served on student leadership. We had these events and like people you would never see at a school sponsored event were at these events because they were desperate for community. They were desperate to see their friends. They were desperate um, to, to feel appreciated, to feel connected. And I think that that's one uh, of the gifts we got out of the pandemic is the sense of, okay, we need a community, but then we lack the consistency to actually keep achieving for our students. Uh, the old adage goes, like when you're flying on an airplane, they give me the briefing, they say to put on your mask first before you can put on the mask for a child. And there's a lot of people who are working in classrooms right now who I feel like are being pushed beyond their limits by factors that are outside of their control. Uh, like during the pandemic, so let's, let, let's start with the fact that because of the history of the profession, uh, the vast majority of people in the profession are women. And that because of our society, the vast majority of like, family care things falls on women disproportionately. So we have basically these matriarchal figures in their family who are responsible for classrooms and instruction, but also for households. And we have a system in the United States right now where like there's not paid family leave guarantee for family members or there's not adequate medical care. And so you have people whose job is to be inside of a classroom working with students and you're absolutely right, ask for consistency, but like they're drowning in many ways. And this is the thing that I've heard a lot from my colleagues. Uh, over the last couple of years, I spent a lot of time talking to and listening to educators and like educators right now in Washington state and across the country are just worn thin. Like it's just thing after thing, after thing, after thing. And what happens is, is when an educator loses the love of learning and sorry, the love of teaching, what happens is, is that they don't leave immediately. Uh, they oftentimes stay in the classroom and then they're not able to have the impact that they had in the past with students. And so essentially we have these people who are overtaxed, not like financially, obviously, uh, but like overtaxed emotionally, overtaxed with the jobs they've been assigned to do. And then like that, that decreases their effectiveness in the classroom and breeds resentment with students. And then finally, when they leave, they're burnt out, but they may have been burnt out for a couple of years. Like there's just a wave of teachers in this state and in the United States in general, who like uh, do not feel like they're being supported. And this is, and honestly, like Washington state has made substantial investment in teacher salaries. This is not about money. This is about, this is about uh, time. This is about workload. This is about additional responsibility beyond what's put, uh, beyond giving instruction to students. And so like the, the teachers are not okay right now. And that's like my number one thing that I'm seeing happen right now is that teachers essentially aren't okay themselves. And so their classrooms are not okay. And we have to do something to figure out a balance between the obligation we put on teachers and the work we ask them to do. Because the teacher is the most important factor in that building. 
like the teacher is the one who makes that learning happening, but that, ha that learning cannot happen if the teacher's not cared for and well at this time, and a lot of folks aren't well. Um, yeah, wow, I really, it's just nice to hear like these conversations happening amongst teachers. Like I think back to like my experience in the school and I'm like that, it would have been nice to know like, okay, there's at least like people are talking about it and like I'm realizing that something is kind of not right. I also have two sisters currently in my sister, one of them is going to high school next year. And then I have another sister who is going to the third grade next year. And my sister who's going to the high school really had this sense of like, she really enjoyed being online and being at home because she felt like she could move freely and like turn off the camera and like kind of like be where she needed to be like lay in bed and like relax and like take care of herself and still listen and engage in class and also just wasn't in a space for like eight hours so like even when there was like a lunch break she was at home she could do like what she wanted to do and like engage in her activities and going back to school there was a sense of just like the hierarchy of like, oh, I don't dismiss you, the bell does. And she's like, I've never been to this school really. Like my time at this school was spent online. Like, who are you? Like, why are you telling me these things? They're just these rules that were imposed to help the students like catch up on missed learning. But it was just like, oh, your phone fell out of your pocket. So now you have to like have a lunch detention, like, and just beginning to, and especially with her and her friends, because they're all, students of color, like just noticing and seeing so clearly that there are like some teachers that are really, really good, but also some teachers that are just um, not aware of the ways that they're treating students. And with the masks too, like mixing up only the students of color's name in the class every single time and not feeling like there's anyone on the administration to talk to because they'll just turn around and be like, okay, well, we talked to them and we tried. And it's like, that's not like how is this helpful? Like how is, how will this encourage students to talk about these things and learn to feel empowered to make changes in their environment? And also with my sister who's going to the third grade, I noticed that there was a lot, she's really creative in ways that I wasn't by the time I reached her age because she got to just kind of, she did her school for like three hours and then she got to mess around and like explore and play a lot more. and. She's incredibly smart and has learned so much through playing that I couldn't sit down and like teach her. And, but that she picked up just by living life and exploring. So I think really asking the question of like, what is the point of learning like math and English and science if you don't know how to be a person in a community or if you don't know how to be in relationship instead of always enforcing like domination over someone else and wanting to get to the top so that you can then be free and not there isn't like really a spirit of collaboration even with like student governments like why would we replicate an outside system that doesn't really work for anyone inside the school like which is where people learn how to be people for the first time and then you see like oh there's the popular kids and the unpopular kids and it's like okay but why does that happen and why is it allowed to be enforced? And why does the budget go only to like the athletes and not the arts? And realizing how much of school is just life practice and watching adults and then replicating that behavior amongst groups of people. And I think to speak to like the putting your mask on first before putting on the mask of a child, like really ha having educators and just sit and really think about like, okay, what am I bringing into the situation? What have I learned? And how do I behave in ways that I may enforce without wanting to systems of oppression in the classroom? Like, what are the things like, okay, when saying the bell doesn't dismiss you or getting upset when students are packing up when the bell rings, but like the bell rings and that's the sign to go. So why is it important that it is you who says that they can go and why is that the hill to die on? But that's just, yeah, really enjoying this conversation so far, but those are just like some thoughts that came up. 
Yeah, I so appreciate um, everyone's contribution. And I would just like to think about, um, so I haven't been um, in my own classroom this year. I have been able to um, be in lots of uh, my colleagues' classrooms this year. Not as much as I would like, but uh, hopefully more next year. Um, but what I um, really have seen is, um, you know, this was uh, an opportunity. I think um, everything, uh, Mandy spoke about it earlier, is that um, this really exacerbated the inequities that we see within our system. And this was an opportunity for us to do things differently. And instead our system in a lot of ways doubled down on the things that weren't already working. And so unfortunately, instead of um, providing opportunities like Laurel was just saying for, for students to dream and to learn and to do things differently and to think about you know, with remote learning, what were the things that worked for students and how could we incorporate that into our day and instead we've doubled down on, on a lot of things. And, and I think one of the um, things that uh, has been um, the most troublesome for me is, is this really this focus and everyone almost has spoken to this is this culture of compliance that we have and really focusing on um, students' behavior being a certain way instead of having the opportunity to um, get to know the student and learn um, what that student needs and how that um, changes in, in different days and different environments. Um, and just really understanding that um, you can't focus both on compliance um, and uh, really focus on learning at the same time. And so really thinking about what is the what is your number one goal and um, learning, great learning, great teachers, um, providing great learning opportunities look very different and encouraging teachers to, to do things differently. And I think that um, is something that I've heard a lot. And I've also um, just seen, uh, to kind of speak again to Mandy um, talking about hopelessness, I've just seen the loss of joy and talking to students and just say everything that I was so excited to come back to school after remote learning isn't here. And so when I um, go into a lunchroom and saw students sitting in chairs face forward, six feet apart from each other, like that's not connection. That's not an opportunity for them to, to, to be in um, support of, you know, to be connecting with one another. And so I think this idea that we're going to get back to normal, or we're going to get back to the learning, or we're going to get back to something that we know wasn't already working um, is, is a missed opportunity. And so I think um, what I would really like us to, to really think about for the next school year is really how can we do things differently? How can we ask our students what they need? How can we ask our families and our community and our educators? We're, we're not going to um, help our educators find joy through self-care like that. We're, we're not going to self-care our way out of, out of this. And so really thinking about what systemic changes do we need to change the culture? What systemic changes do we need to support? Um, Nate brought up really well thinking about what, it, what does time look like? What does support look like? What is um, just opportunities to do things differently and, and to be open to those dreaming spaces? Um, and I think we, we definitely need more of that. Um, we, our, our teachers are incredible in the state and, and across the country. It's, it's not a lack of phenomenal teachers. Our kids are our why and are amazing. It's, not, um, it's nothing wrong with our kids. Um, it's our system that needs to change. And if we don't change it soon, I'm very concerned with, um, with what, uh, where, where we're gonna be at. Um, to carry off of every, what everybody else said, um, this year I actually didn't return back to the um, classroom. I stayed in virtual spaces because um, the pandemic really opened my eyes to like, as a student, the safest space I feel is in my own. And the classroom was never really a safe space for me. And collectively, I think, I think a lot of um, people mentioned on the act of compliance, but also the need for 
like the pandemic highlighted health issues and the importance of mental health or even like physical health. And you could get an excusal because of these reasons, like this is okay, everybody was getting sick. Um, but in the classroom spaces, even when we went back to the classroom, if there was an exam and you caught COVID, um, people were inclined to still going to class and students were very stressed. Like you would be there with the mask, but people would be coughing. And so like, I think it's kind of hard because as like young people, there were people in classrooms who didn't necessarily care about the health risks because we're young, it's like college. And then there was people who were really like stressed because they live in other spaces and they travel back home and they have family. So when you mesh all of that together, it was like very stressful because it was the fear of like, are we gonna get sick? Will the teachers care enough to excuse the learning because everything's still going at the same pace, even though a lot of us are getting sick? There was a beautiful opportunity because a lot of teachers provided a digital form of the classroom, like lectures, a lot of them were required to be accessible online. And so some teachers took the opportunity to allow students, hey, for whatever reason, if you can't, like attendance doesn't have to be mandatory, which kind of was beautiful for me because like the classroom honestly hasn't been a safe space. So to be able to have that learning and to be able to like feed off of like doing something that I love, but also having a beautiful space that I can create was a beautiful opportunity. So I think that like something that we really have to think about is what does it mean to create a safe environment? And how can we hear our students? Because like my friends were talking about, this is so stressful. Like, I don't know how I can juggle everything. Like a lot of them have jobs. A lot of them are doing things outside of school, but then they're coming to the classroom and that's their one priority. Um, other extenuating circumstances don't matter because you're a student first, but really other people have lives and they have things happening. So how can we, see each individual case and take it from that and allow flexibility. Because like if the main priority is learning and students find other ways to learn or access it, is it really that hard to make an exception? And then also something beautiful was like mental health was taken a lot more seriously. Like some students who felt overwhelmed, like, oh, that's okay, you don't have to come in or, or like hearing people out and not necessarily having to have an explanation. Um, for that was really beautiful. So I think the conversation really kind of comes down to what spaces are we allowing students to speak in the classroom and then also having students like maybe learn how to advocate for themselves and ask for help because like if we have a current atmosphere where it's like no exceptions maybe students are afraid to even speak up for themselves and they don't know what the space is or how to get that. Um, yeah. Oh, so many great thoughts, man. This is wonderful to hear everybody's uh, experiences, and uh, I think there's there's a few things that I heard there that I can that I can kind of relate to. Um, one being the the consistency piece, um, not just for students but for for all of us, right? Like, I mean, there's been so many difficulties that we've all faced over the last few years, and I know we've had a lot of teacher turnover. Um, but we've had a lot of admin turnover too. And, you know, I agree with Nate, like the teachers are the most important people in the building. Um, I, I mean, you know, in a way, like I, that feels terrible to say, but uh, you know, the, the success of the students lies in the, the success of the teachers, uh, which doesn't mean that we're more important than all this, you know, the, the people surrounding us um, because we're not successful without, you know, all the people that surround us. But, um, you know, we've had a lot of admin turnover in my building over the last couple of years, which has led to a lot of, you know, lack of consistency for us uh, as, as teachers and, and knowing, you know, what we're expected to do. And, uh, you know, we're, we're juggling so many different things and trying to, to teach and trying to care for ourselves and trying to care for our kids and all of the things that we're trying to do. Uh, and when we show up then day out and, and, you know, yesterday I was told this, now today I'm told this and Tomorrow, I don't know what I'm going to be told, and if if what I'm doing is the right thing or or what, and that that's a really difficult thing. Um, and I think that uh, you know when we talk about consistency, I don't think it means that we need to consistently hold fast to the things that we've always done and keep doing them because we're like, well, you know, we always hear people say uh, we're doing this because it's the way we've always done it. We have to remain consistent. 
And we see a lot of that, you know, even when we look at those things and say like, those things aren't working. Um, consistency doesn't mean that we have to hold tight to those things that we've always done because we've always done them. What, when I say consistency, I think it means that we consistently day in and day out need to keep trying every single day to be better than we were the day before. That's a model that I live by in my own life. And I think that it's something that we need to, to adhere to in our schools is how are we working? How are we trying every single day in a consistent way to continue to move the needle in some way so that every student that's walking through our doors does feel safe, does feel welcome and included. And like we're offering something that they're wanting to come there for, right? Like, and, and that's the thing, like if, if, we're, if we're not offering things that students feel a need to show up for, then they're not gonna feel a need to show up, right? I mean, that's, it's that way with anything in life. I mean, we as people, when we go places in our own lives, we go to those places that we choose to go to because they offer us something that we want that we can't get somewhere else. When we choose the relationships that we have in life, we choose people to be around us because we feel safe and comfortable with them and because they offer us something that makes us feel valuable that we can't get from other people. We, we need to do the same thing in our schools. Our people in schools need to be people that our students feel that they can gravitate towards. And they're not gonna feel that way with every adult in the school, but they at least need to have some adults in the school that they feel that way. Every student needs to have adults in the school that they feel comfortable with and safe with and that they come there because I know that I have these people that know me and I know that I have these people that care for me and that they would be there for me no matter what the case is because they know and care for me as a person more than as a student. Um, I asked my daughter this question. I have a daughter that's heading into uh, 10th grade this, uh, this coming school year. Uh, which is just crazy to me to, to even think about. She just finished her freshman year, but at a mid-high. Uh, and so now she's going to be starting up at the uh, the high school as a sophomore. And I told her I was coming on here today and the questions that we would be talking about and said, what, what are your thoughts? What do you think? Uh, and, you know, she 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 didn't quite know at first what to say. And then she shared a couple things and uh, we went and ran some errands and came back and she said, oh, I got, I got one more thing for you. So she thought about it a little bit more. Uh, the biggest thing that, that she really uh, focused on was uh, treat, treat people like people, right? Like treat your students like people um, and show them respect. Because what she said, what I hear all the time, and of course that, that looks different, you know, uh, for every person, respect is not the same thing for everybody. But what she said is, you know, what I would hear a lot from adults is, uh, is respect is earned, it's not given. And, and then it would be this, this, this total uh, double standard, you know, that I hear that from you, uh, but I'm not getting that from you. Like you want me to, to give you all this respect, but you don't treat me like uh, an adult. You, you treat me like an adult when you want me to be, uh, but not when I want to be, you know, it's always this double standard. I, I remember that so fondly or so, so strongly, like not fondly, strongly from when I was a, a teenager. I took mental notes as a teenager all the time. That's like, I would always tell myself, when you're an adult, remember this, remember how this feels. Don't do this to teenagers when you're an adult, whether you have kids or whatever the case is. And I wasn't gonna be a teacher, so I didn't think of it from that perspective, but I'm glad that I still think back on that now as a high school teacher, because I remember that. I, I remember adults telling me like, hey, you know, you need to grow up and be responsible and be an adult and, and everything. And that only, that only applied when they wanted it to, right? But then when I would say, hey, give me responsibility, treat me like an adult, right? Like, yeah, I'm still a young adult. Yeah, I'm still growing and learning and everything. I mean, we all are, no matter how old we are, right? But but when I want that from you, you got to give it to me at that point too, right? Like respect is a two-way street. Uh, there's got to be give and take in everything that we do. And yeah, it's 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 got to be earned. But uh, I mean, I, I, almost, I almost feel kind of like we, I mean, does it have to be earned or can we just give people respect from the beginning, uh, you know, with each other? Can I give you respect and can you give, you don't have to earn it. I mean- Let's let's just start with respect for each other uh, and then figure out what that looks like as we move forward. Uh, you know, it'll look different in my relationship with you than it will with this person or that person. But let's just be respectful to each other and learn what that looks like between and among the people that we're dealing with um, and, and just talk to people like they're people. Right. Like that's my biggest thing. Um, I, I treat my kids like they're like they're like they're humans because they are. I want to learn about who they are. I want to learn about what makes them tick. 
and, and really like, what do we need to do? We need to find that out. We need to talk to students. That's why I'm so glad that the students that are here today are here. That's why I asked my daughter, you know, her thoughts before I came on. Um, one of my leadership students, when we were wrapping up the year, did a survey um, of probably a quarter of our population. I think we got about uh, 250 responses on the survey um, about uh, behaviors around skipping school. Like, what? why do you skip school? Uh, there was a whole bunch of questions that she asked about like why students choose what classes do they use computers do they response is so in love uh I think thread there was exactly that. It was teachers uh listen to me, they they know who I am, they treat me like a human, they show me respect. Uh, they give me room to make mistakes and to know that even though I'm making mistakes that I can keep showing up and learning from them. They give me a safe environment to do that in and to know that I'm still going to be loved when I show up tomorrow. Um, they make mistakes too and they admit when they do. Um, we just, we need an environment of, of humanity and, and, and respect and, and care. And one, as I said, where we're offering something that students feel like they they need to get from us and we got to ask them what that is that's not up to us to say hey we're giving you something you need you need to learn what that is and show up and get it we need to say what is it that you need that you can't get somewhere else and how can we work with you to offer that in a way that you actually feel like this is a valuable place for you to to, to show up every day yeah that's that's such, such great great input and, and feedback i really appreciate that i'm hearing these themes of of communicating with students learning what makes them tick treating them with respect uh having consistency for for everyone uh, providing mental health supports I, i'm wondering are, are there other things that that we need to do for 2022 23 not just for students but also for teachers, because Brooke, you said that we can't just self-care our way out of this. If the teachers are, are not well, then the students won't be well. So, so are, are there things that we can do for the teachers as well as the students moving into the next school year, whether it's on the building level, the district level, or even the state level? Um, I'll, I'll hop in real quick, because I think it kind of ties in a little bit to Something I wanted, I, I think I wanted to point out about the great conversations in the last question. And the students were really reminding me of this. Um, and then it also reminded me something of, I remember Brooke saying, I, I, I think it's really important for, for all of us to note that when we talk about community, like that we all kind of have a real understanding of what it is we're actually talking about. I, I remember um, Brooke saying, you know, the sharing, expressing her concerns about uh, the misuse of mindfulness in classrooms, right? Um, is it for the, the benefit of the student or is it for uh, productivity and control, right? And so schools tend to be really transactional because of the way that the system is designed. Uh, it wants to find an easy out to check a box, right? So we're gonna do a professional development. We're gonna find a guest speaker. We're gonna find some sort of manual where you could talk about building community. We'll do advisory things. And students like students have the keenest sense of fairness. And it's it, when we talk about community, I think we need to be mindful that it needs to be organic and it needs to be authentic. It needs to be reflective and, and driven from the students and the communities it's intended to serve. And I think my, I think one thing I, I would add to kind of address some of your question about how, how can we do this work moving forward? Um, I was uh, having another conversation and someone asked me, well, what can schools do? Um, what should schools be doing to be increasing family engagement? And I responded with, well, what has the school done to deserve it? I think that kind of goes back to the last comment, right? Um, and it's one of those things that if, if schools, if teachers, administrators, staff, they don't show up into their students' communities, ready to participate and be involved, they, have no, they should have no expectation that that's gonna be rescinded or if there's gonna be trust right away. Like there's a lot of conversations, like tough conversations that need to be had up front because a lot of communities are still facing a lot of 
uh, injustice and inequities within our schools. And we need to be able to talk about that rather than just try to avoid it and have a nice, have a nice hug and put on a smile and say, okay, we did community time. Now it's time to go back to work. And I think that applies for us as teachers too. Um, I, I know, uh, I, you know, I know my colleague, you know, we're, you know, we're in native education. So we always have, you know, various medicines and, um, you know, the, the opportunity for, for my, for her and myself and my, my fellow teachers who knew where to come and students, like they knew that they could come to our portable and have a smudge. And like, they just knew that there was a place for them to, to, to have that self-care and they knew, they knew what was going to be available to them. And I think we just kind of, need to be mindful that um, the, the supports are, need to be unique, a, a, as unique and diverse as the people that need them. And we just need to expand um, our opportunities because sometimes it's really easy as, as a teacher to get siloed, uh, for departments to get isolated, for high, you know different schools and buildings to get isolated just as much as different um, grade bands and, and subject areas. I think it's about making sure that our schools can create opportunities for everyone to find their people and find their best, best selves and find ways to bring that back to create a more beautiful, bigger community. Yeah, um, and I would, I, oh. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, sorry, Laura, I'll be really fast. I would just, yes, like yes to everything Jared just said. And I think we have to really focus on wellness. And I think we really have to focus on on dreaming. Like I think the system really forces us to head down, get things done. And I think we've lost this, the time to dream, to be together, to embody that humanizing um, aspect with one another. And I really appreciate what Jared, and I just wanna amplify what he just said is that there is no one way to do it. And so as many um, folks that you have, you need to have that many different ways. And one thing that has really um, sort of been uh, foundational to me is really thinking about community-centered wellness. And so um, if I'm well, but Jared's not, then collectively we're unwell. And so how do we help our students? How do we help our staff? How do we help our administrators really have that deep understanding and compassion um, to show up for one another and to notice that I, um, I was uh, on the farm uh, teaching a lesson and uh, I heard two uh, young ladies and I love this. Um, I heard one of them say, Man, I haven't seen you at school for a while. Like, where have you been? And she said, well, things you know, at home haven't been so great. And the other girl turned to her and said, well, don't you know that's why we come to school? And I was just like, wow, like they get it. They get it that you come to school to heal. You come to school to learn. You come to school to have joy. And if we're not providing those opportunities, we're missing the mark. And so, yes, academics is important. And how are we providing that instruction in a space where students can grow into their fully embodied self so they can show up. They, she wasn't saying, this wasn't a teacher saying, where have you been? Your attendance, right? She said, I missed you. Like I noticed you weren't here. It's not the same when you're not here. And so how can we keep providing those opportunities? So kids want to come, right? Why, why do they keep showing up if we're providing things that they don't want to be like, we got to, we got to change where we're at and we got to make, um, also opportunities for our educators to find that joy and to be disciplined in hope. Sorry, Laurel. No worries, no worries. Um, I'm just thinking about my, I've had teachers I've, I've truly loved so much. And the, I used to like email them periodically <laughs> um, just to be like, hey, just thinking about you, just wanted to like, you really changed my life in the fourth grade when you read that book. And it's like my favorite book to this day. Um, and I think of particularly my music teacher in, I had a really hard time in elementary school, but she let me come to school early. Like I would wake up and go to school an hour early and just to be in the music room and like play the marimba because I thought the marimba ensemble was so cool. And I was like, this is what I want to do when I get to the sixth grade. Like 
and I would play in there for hours. And then when I left elementary school, like through middle school, because they were right next door, I still went back when she would have run the ensemble because I was like, I'll help you out. And like, I want to hang out and be here with like the new people that are going to be in the group and also be there with her. And then when I went to college at Western, she was also there. So she started teaching at the college that so we would meet for coffee sometimes and just like catch up and talk about life. But I think I really wish there had been a way to have our teachers be a part of our real life because there's, we always joke like, oh, I saw my teacher at the store, super weird. Like <laughs> did not think that they shop, but they do shop and they live in the area with us. And I just think of how I can't imagine being a teacher and like having students I like and then them leaving and being like, okay, I guess like that's that on the relationship and just facilitating more so that it's easier to just be people together, even though we are at different stages of life. And also teachers are really smart people and are have interests and passions. And like the like where I've learned the most in classes have been teachers that are really passionate about what they're talking about. Like I did not want to read the Iliad. I did not think it was interesting, but my teacher loved like poetry and that kind of literature. And so through those experiences, I also like really enjoyed the process and walked away with so much. And I think being forced to do anything is not fun. And it's like weird, but I feel like teachers and students are in the same position of like, listen, we don't wanna do what we're doing right now, but we have to because we have to. And I think setting up even systems of, okay, these are the things that we have to do like per the state. How do we think we can get there? Like, where do you feel confident? Like as a class, what do we need more help in? And like, how can we shape together to pass like those standardized tests and like make it so that I don't really know what happens when people don't pass standardized tests, but it's like no one interferes, like disrupts things, but to do it in a way that everyone in the room is like, okay, this is something that we all want to do or like, I don't know, like having goals and then like reaching out and seeing like, what can we do? Who can do what? Where should you go? Like even having teachers, like being able to maybe have more flexibility with your teachers. So you can, you don't have to be with someone you might not necessarily click with and have a contentious relationship with, but you can be with a teacher that you get or spend more time in a class that you just need more time in instead of like needing to go back and forth and really just, I think, removing those borders that are kind of just made up and being in class just to learn like at a class that had like those walls that couldn't open and close and the teachers since it was both history just like opened the partition and you could kind of actually choose like okay I'm going to go to listen to Mr. Steele today or okay I'm going to sit on Mr. Wolkowski's side today like and see what's going on and it was a really nice and we could do group projects like across like classes and that was just a really nice experience and I think it was also just more fun for the teachers as well because I remember like feeling like they were my friends when I was in class with them um yeah and I just wish like there was better ways to hold teachers in our communities instead of just kind of I don't know, like wondering about them like later on in life and be like I have no way to like contact this person or like reach out again or just say thank you or help out but I want to, so, yeah. Laurel, that was so insightful. Both of your responses have been so insightful um, because I think that you point out, I love that you've provided examples of educators that to me, those educators have a deep understanding of what students actually need beyond academics. Because I think um, we, all, we always talk about academics and, and that we'll, students need to learn and learning loss and this and that, but I don't know that we know what academics are essential. We just have thrown a whole bunch of things and we've lost sight of why we even have to do the things that we say we have to do. Um, I think one of the biggest things is that we need to reassess what school is for. Like, what is school for? Why are we there? Why do we spend, you know, a significant portion of childhood uh, in a school building? And, I, and we're seeing in real time what society actually needs from its schools, and it's not more academics. 
it's more executive functioning. Like uh, how, how, do, how do people just regulate themselves and move through life and become lifelong learners and, and access the things that are, make, make learning exciting for them? Um, and, and then also just being a good community member. Like we have gone from, um, I don't even know, I, you know, speaking of the history of the United States, I, I don't even know if we really have ever had an understanding of what community is. I think that there are portions and, and cultures within our society that understand community much better than the actual whole of the United States. Um, but instead of learning that and, and becoming a cohesive community that works together, we have become more, even more individualized and lack skills in building community and connecting with each other. And so Laurel, what you've talked about with your teachers, they have an understanding that you, like you Laurel, needed a safe space to go and a place that you're going to go and, and you're going to experience life and, and be excited and get ready for the school day. And then you kept coming back to that or like the sharing of the, the classroom space. These are all things that we should be able to do within a school building. And, but the first step to be able to do that, because there are so many educators, the educators that are right here on this panel clearly are educators who understand the, the what students actually need. Um, but this is, it's not, this is not the norm. Like, I mean, teachers, I think educate, most educators understand this, but they, they have a lack of understanding of how to do this. Um, but it comes down to, well, we have this box and we're all going to fit into this box no matter what. We don't remember why we built the box. We have no idea why we built the box, but we have this box. So we're going to continue to go into this box. And so that's what we need. We just need to reassess what school is even for and then uh, create opportunities to ensure that we are developing whole human beings. I think like for some like ideas and recommendations is like since we live in a kind of individualist society I think the beauty of understanding community learning is like amazing and like a recommendation could be like what if we mandatory like we added an extended time to the classroom but like 15 minutes dedicated to not academics and like left that block of space because I think teachers need more time, but they need room. Like when we're in the root of our youth, we have circle and we have space where we have a talking circle and everybody goes around and they just talk. They say how they feel. And I think the stress of teachers is like, there's so many boxes to fill. There's a time quench and it has to be done. We have to check off this box. But if you gave them that space where they don't have to check off all of the other things, but they have that presence with their students, students would look forward to those 15 minutes, you know? And like, if we create spaces where we have a structure that's individualistic, that is very, um, very kind of like standards we must follow but if we regulated creating spaces like if we had self-efficacy classes where students learn how to express themselves so we had rooms of relaxation like relaxation room meditation rooms where here's a space where you can just relax you can just breathe if we kind of systematically brought that into spaces I think it would allow like students to kind of be able to like be a little more free you know those dream spaces it's kind of like homeroom we used to like have that but like have it with your teacher so you have that space and that time to be and then like another idea is like I think that if you want families to be more involved you have to celebrate students because like who doesn't want their child to be celebrated and to come in this space to like, oh my goodness, you can like hype them up. And um, I think it goes on that, that idea a lot of people spoke of like when students aren't coming, but they do show up coming with love. Like whenever I come back to like my space in the root of our youth, Miss Miller's just like, I'm so happy you're here. I miss you so much. I'm so, and like that ounce of love like when a student's like you don't emphasize on like the negative of like where were you the classroom there's only five students like that's that negative reinforcement but when you welcome somebody with love and you come with curiosity 
it's just like you feel like you belong or somebody sees you. So I think if that celebration and that just like, what do you want to see more of? Or how did this end of this day and how did this learning go to, for you? I think allowing students to speak without being defensive or hypersensitive on the criticism, like if you want students to speak, you have to be ready to hear it because they'll silence. If that first interaction you ask and you're not receptive, students will never do it again. So even understanding when you're asking questions, if you're not ready to receive it, you shouldn't really ask for that space because it could be dangerous. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with everything that you just said and, and what I heard from Aurel a few minutes ago too. And like, um, we, we have to make time for the things that we believe are the most important. We absolutely have to do that. Um, and our relationships and our safe uh, uh, spaces and environments um, those are the most important thing. It all starts there. The academics, everything else that we're trying to do in schools is we're never going to get to any of that if we don't create a space where everybody feels welcome and safe and comfortable. Um, and, you know, I, I, as, as Brooke said earlier, uh, if, if, if one person isn't well, then as a community, we're not well. And, and it ha that has to be the truth. I mean, uh, hearing you say earlier, I think, Michelle, you said earlier about, you know, feeling more comfortable in, in remote learning because you didn't feel like school is a safe place for you. Um, and I think there's two ways to look at that. Like if a student feels like this is a better environment for me, not because that one was really like unsafe or not great or whatever, but like this is just better for me. That That's one thing. But when a, a person chooses something, not necessarily because it's better for all the right reasons, but it's better because that was so bad for me. Um, that that's that's a, a red flag that we need to look at. Like what, what if, if school is not a good place for every student that needs to be served by that school, then it's not a good place for any of them. We have to make sure that we're creating a space that's good for everyone. Um, I like what you said about creating community and, and dedicating time to uh, to just build the community and to to be humans. And like you know, uh, Laurel was saying a lot about you know teachers being human and and, and students being able to see that side. And um, that's one of the things that I started doing you know a few years ago was just creating circle time at the beginning. I, I do two different check ins with my students when they come in, and it's a it's a non negotiable. It's every single day, every single class. The minute that they come in, there's a Google form that they fill out that asks how they're doing today and why, and they get to go on and tell me. Um, and that's just between the two of us. And I read them while I'm taking attendance and everything. And I'll drop little sticky notes on certain students' desks certain days, uh, whether it's a good comment or a you know worrisome comment or whatever. I'll just randomly pick a few and drop a little sticky note as I'm walking around and we're circling up. And then we always do circle community time at the beginning where we go around and share how we're feeling at the moment too. Um, and I always, I'm always the one to start it because I always want to model for students and I always tell them like I'm not going to ask you do some to do something that I'm not willing to do myself. I'm not going to ask you to be vulnerable and put yourself out there, which teachers do all the time. Like, oh, be vulnerable, try this, fail this way, whatever. And then the students are like, well, why don't you do it, mister? And I'm like, oh, no, that's too scary. I don't want to do that. And, well, I can't ask you to do that then if I'm not willing to do it myself too, right? So I, I with my circle time, I always start and now I talk about my own life, right? Like if I'm sharing something I'm happy about or not so happy about, um, it's whatever I'm legitimately feeling at that moment as a human being, uh, in my own life, you know, and my kids know who I am, they know what I'm about, they know what I'm going through. Um, and because I create an environment with them like that, then they know that they can trust, you know, trust me to be able to talk about those things uh, as well. And I think that, um, you know, that, that's, that's something, as I said earlier, that, that we can offer students is an environment where they feel like uh, there's, there's something that they're getting out of that that's different, something that they're not maybe necessarily getting somewhere else. And we always talk about the importance of community and it, it all starts with, with building community together um, in that way. Uh, you know, Mandy, I 100% agree with what you were saying about, uh, you know, we need to reimagine what school is even supposed to be about. Like, what's it for, right? Like what, and as I said earlier, just because we've done something doesn't mean that we always have to do it that way. Um, I saw some comments uh, in the in the chat that were good. David Berg shared a couple of good comments and thinking about like, you know, looking at uh, academics and like what kind of academics, right? Like I'm a CTE teacher. Um, so I teach all kinds of stuff, life after high school, like legit life skills about how to be an adult and cooking and interior design and sewing and child development and how to become a teacher. And I teach a music production program uh, with, you know, audio engineering and recording and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, if you think about it, um, we're looking at uh, a constant push to like uh, continually lower the number of credits and requirements and all of these things that students are asked to do 
um, in schools. There's a push right now for a 20 credit diploma. Um, and it's not the things like CTE and music and all of those things that are being protected and included in that. It's, it's at the exclusion of those things, math, science, English, history, all of those things that we've always done. Um, not to say that they're not important, but those things aren't going anywhere when we look at the constant stripping away of things and saying, well, we got to reimagine school and maybe it means kids have to go less and maybe they need fewer credits and this and that. Well, may, maybe, but like also, why is it that the things that are staying there are the same things, the same things that we've always done? Why aren't we questioning like, are those things really the things that we need to be keeping there, right? And people are like, oh no, don't touch the English and math. It's like, we got to learn all that. Well, yeah, it's important, right? But like, it's not the most important. Um, and we're seeing that over and over, like that doesn't necessarily need to be what school is about. Um, so I just, I, yeah, I, I think community um, 100%. One of the things that we see, uh, we're an AVID national demonstration school at Mount Vernon High School. And AVID is a program that is not just about academics, it's about community and support. Like, and the students that are in that are in a community. They have a cohort that they're with for four years with the same teacher, with the same family. I mean, they call it an avid family um, because, you know, that, that's a place that they know that I can go and have support from people that I'm with, from community, from my teacher that I'm with for four years. Um, how do we build that kind of environment to every class and to every school so that every student feels like that's a place where they have that community? We, we need that in, in every aspect of every school. Yeah, amen to that, and 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 thank you so much for all your comments. I'm I'm sorry we're over time here. It was just such a, a rich discussion here. If some of you have to leave, like Lion Terry had to leave, um, feel free to do that. What I was thinking in our last few minutes here, as we wrap up, uh, I, I wanted to give uh, the teachers an opportunity just to to share briefly what they think their their superpower is. I, I certainly have I, uh, opinions about what each of your superpowers are, but uh, but I, I'd love to hear that as sort of a, a closing. And then I'd like to give each of the students, uh, Laurel and Michelle and Waylon, just a chance to to give any last words. Uh, does that sound okay? Okay, um, great. Um, I'll, with the teachers, we'll, we'll do your superpowers quick. I'll, I'll go Jared, then, um, then we'll go to Brooke, then Robert and Mandy. And then um, students, uh, feel free to, to chime in with your last words uh, as, as you feel it. So uh, Jared, uh, briefly, what would you say your superpower is? Uh, <laughs> that's a big question. Um, I, I would say, I would say for me, it would often be being brave enough to be myself. Um, you know, you can see my background. I may be the only human in this space, but I am not alone. Um, I am in class right now. Like this is our original classroom. I am surrounded by plant and animal relations and teachers and medicine. Like my feet are literally on the earth to ground me. Um, I think a lot of what I bring is just being who I am, connecting with other similar students and sharing with students an opportunity to see, to peel back a lot of the facades and pressures of the world, to see all of the traditional knowledge and beauty and gifts that are already in us to tap into and to really really learn and grow and revitalize all of the many assets that we have that society doesn't often let us use. Awesome. Brooke, what's your superpower? This is a tough one. Um, Cause I can think of like all the things I would like to do, like be invisible or fly. Um, but I think if I had to think about my superpower it would be um, just caring. I think caring and critical hope. Um, I think I always, um, I always want to do better, and I always want to encourage those around me um, to do better and um, change the space around us as well. And so, um, understanding that it's not always about doing more. Sometimes being better is actually I'm learning about doing less and being more intentional and present with the folks around you. Um, and so I have learned a lot um, during the last two and a half years about myself um, and about those around me. And I think um, one thing is just really, um, just really learning how to be still and to be present um, is often the best gift I can give myself and, and those around me because it gives them permission 
um, to be still and be present as well. And so, um, yeah, and care and critical hope and being still. That's three. You said one. I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's all good. <laughs> Robert, what is your superpower? Uh, it's got to be patience. Um, I, I am always working on having more of it. But uh, I'm fortunate to have a good deal of patience in a lot of circumstances. Um, and I'd say it's helpful for me in the classroom because uh, it helps me when I'm trying to create with my students a, a community of care and, and you know, welcome and support and love and all of those things. Um, there are a lot of circumstances that can be really trying, you know, um, things that don't always go the way that you want them to go. Uh, and you know, I just as people in communication with other people in any environment, um, when we lose our patience with uh, circumstances or other people, that's a lot of times when we resort to things that we maybe say or do that we don't mean or don't want to do. Um, and you know, I know that in my in my environment with my students, um, they need me to be able to show up and be there and to know that uh, you know they can they can. I don't want to say that they're not going to get to me. You know what I mean? But like. Sometimes, you know, a student might say something or whatever that might get under somebody's skin and it, it might get under my skin, but the ability to be able to just say like in that moment, like don't take it personally, like that probably wasn't about you, right? So like just stay consistent and stay calm and patient and be there for that student, you know, so that you're not losing your patience, not losing your cool with them. Um, because, you know, I've seen in the comments and heard from other people that, you know, if you ask people for opinions or you ask them to show up or you tell them that things are a certain way and then it's not that way or you don't listen, um, then they're not going to trust you that it's that way in the future. So I try to create this environment where it's unconditional, unrelenting, it's it's care and support and patience and all of those things. And uh, you can show up and you can have a good day and not a good day. And I'm still going to be me and I'm still going to be the same with you every single time. I'm going to love and care for you no matter whether it's a good day or not. Amen. Mandy, what's your superpower? Um, I think it's my uh, ability to adapt, like I just adapt to whatever situation, whatever person, whatever environment. Um, and it comes from the recognition that each individual has endless potential and is humanity. Um, that um, I have a great capacity for unconditional love um, and a positive outlook with a willingness to break all the rules to... <laughs> do whatever I need to do to adapt to that student or that um, environment, new work environment or new classroom or school or wh whatever it is. Nate, what's your supercar? Yeah, so it's interesting. I think the term public intellectual is a weird term that I never apply to myself. Um, but I think that's exactly what students need in the classroom. And so I'm a pretty vociferous reader and consumer information. And so I honestly think that like I'm constantly consuming information reading journal articles, reading books, uh, listening to podcasts and having conversations with students about those things. And so I'm modeling the real life applicability of what we're learning about. Like I teach AP comparative government politics. There's not a real like demand in the job market for somebody with obscure knowledge about the Iranian system of government and how it's different than the system of government in say China. Uh, but like, it's cool to know stuff. And so like, I constantly try to model my students that like, being a learned person and learning about things constantly is a good way to be. And in the big scheme of things, you'll learn more outside of school than you learn in school, but while you're in school, you're gonna learn. Now, while I have the microphone, there's one thing I do wanna to say to folks listening to this conversation. Uh, the one point that I noticed where the students all nodded the most was when uh, adults threw them talk about respect. And so just, I'm gonna also say that that is a challenge to folks, uh, bring students to tables. And uh, when you bring them to tables, listen to them and show them the respect that you would demand yourself. And so my other superpower is making a point when it's not the time to make a point. <laughs> well, uh, speaking of students and respect, students now, I would like to give you the opportunity for any last words after this amazing conversation. Uh, Laurel, Michelle, Waylon, the floor is yours. Okay, I will go. Um, I took, I, I didn't take that many notes. I wrote down one point that like really stuck with me out of everything. And uh, it came from Laurel uh, about the, the sense of in, individu individualistic freedom um, to, to design who you are and who you're meant to be, because that's how we build community. 
Um, and I think that's something that school has a great opportunity to build because right now it is about checking the boxes. Like everyone said, you need to check the boxes. And if we're able to break that barrier down and, and let ourselves explore less, less school hours in the day to maybe explore um, who we are, career opportunities, what we want to do, who we want to be, who we need to be to have a prosperous future, because we wonder so often why our parents are so like, let me provide for myself. Um, like, like my parents' generation, what I see around and around my community is that I have to provide for myself because they were always forced to check the boxes. They were always forced to sit in a classroom and be, this is the way it is. This is the way I have to go. I have to go and work a nine to five till I'm 60 and then I retire and then I live the rest of my life. It's, it's not, and, and we're here to break those, those barriers, um, and, and change the way we look at things because we don't all need to be the same because our systems will never change if that is the case. And I always like to leave uh, with a quote. It's a really simple one, but I think it speaks a lot to how students are going to reshape uh, these, these new systems we have to tackle. And it's, uh, we did not come to fear the future, we came to shape it and that's Barack Obama. Um, and I think that um, students are, are the mold makers uh, right now. And that um, if we have teachers like you and, and educators like you by our side, we'll completely reshape uh, the way our future is looking. Thank you. Yeah, this has been really wonderful. I, <laughs> I was texting Michelle at the beginning, like, okay, thoughts? Like, what do you think is gonna happen? I was like, I have no idea what we're gonna talk about, but I'm excited. And yeah, I'm really glad I showed up. I guess my final thoughts are that I used to have like a lot of anxiety about like, oh, I have to like change the world. I have to fix everything because you learn about like climate change in like the fourth grade. And it's like, okay, guys, like, good luck. Okay, it's up to you. And I was like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Like I'm spinning my wheels. And I've come to realize that really just having people actually just say, I have no idea what's going on. And then just talking about how we have no idea what's going on or no clue what the best thing to do is, even though it's a much slower process, I find that it's the process that I need in this moment. I've been, I have plants and I've been growing food with my, my dad and just really watching plants grow. Like they just start so small, but it's just the care and the tending to and knowing that like, yeah, one day this little seed will become a tree and some trees are just spring up out of nowhere because you're not really noticing, but that life finds a way and just is always wanting to be and exist. Just having these conversations and like, this is, there's a little seedling and I don't know what it's gonna shape up to be exactly, but I know that it's, good and will grow and so I'm willing to be there and on the journey and so these spaces are just fill me with so much hope and it's easy to feel a lot of despair but just how the news is like this is all the terrible things that are happening today anyways uh good luck and just slowing down and just talking and just sitting and being still and really just reflecting is so it's very it's, this is like really medicine to me so yeah thank you everyone for being here Yes, um, I think my main takeaway is, I think this was such a rich and fruitful conversation. And I think the main takeaway is like, I think we need to find spaces where we can have student base and teacher base, um, like reform and like learning and like, like things that can change the system, but we spearhead it from the voices of students and teachers. And sometimes that might mean, mean making a space for just students, making space for just teachers, and then a collective space where they can come together. And it's not only like hearing and talking, but it's action. Like we p care about things that we put our money in and our time. So we need to fund our dreams. So like beyond this space, we need to fund resources that are pouring into our st students and our teachers. And like something like Laurel said that reminded me of this like quote, because like I'm I'm also a poet. It's like when they bury your dreams, remember you're a seed. 
and wait till harvest time because you'll grow. Um, but yeah, I really enjoy this space and appreciate these conversations. So thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you, Michelle, Laurel, and Waylon, and Jared, and Brooke, and Robert, Mandy, Nate, and Lion. And thanks to all of you for participating in the chat and for asking questions. Special thanks to Root of Our Youth and to the Washington State High School Democrats. I'll include links to their websites in the follow-up email, which you should receive in your inbox in about 24 hours. Our next webinar is Wednesday, August 24th at 1230 PM. Dr. Tanya May, the Washington State Assistant Superintendent for Special Education Services, will share an overview of special education in Washington State, focusing on inclusionary practices, myths and facts, mental health supports. And Dr. May will be joined by Lee Collier, He's the Director of School Health and Student Safety at the Washington State Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction to discuss ending harmful practices of restraint and isolation. Students will share feedback and experiences in the classroom. Spanish interpretation and closed captioning in English will be available. The registration link will be on our website, educationvoters.org. Just click on events, then lunchtime webinars, and I'll share the information in the follow-up email as well. And please join us for our annual event on October 13th from 11.30 to 1 p.m. for an in-person and statewide online free convening to celebrate the brilliance and advocacy efforts of Washington students. It will be an inspirational event to remember. So RSVP today to reserve your seat. The registration link is on our website, educationvoters.org. Just click on events. Thank you to each of you for joining us today. If you have additional questions or comments, please send them to me at eric, A-R-I-K, at educationvoters.org. A recording of today's presentation will be available on our website, educationvoters.org, and will be sent to you in the follow-up email. Please feel free to share this recording with your friends and colleagues. If you'd like to learn more about League of Education Voters or support our work, just visit our website, educationvoters.org. Thank you again for attending. Each one of us has the right to feel safe and valued. Together, we will fight for a world in which true educational and economic equity exists. We look forward to seeing you at future webinars. Laurel, Michelle, Waylon, Jared, Nate, Robert, Mandy, Brooke, and Lyon, thank you so much for all you do for Washington State students and families. I hope you have an amazing rest of your week, one that's as amazing as you are.